uh, for that. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And when you have it, say, there is a promise. It reads this way. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He says, I will make you a great nation. And look at this. He says, I will bless you and I will make your name great. And also you shall be a blessing. I like this part of verse three because it's the promise of protection when he says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Just say, God's got my back. He says, and in all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Praise the Lord. This morning, I want to take a few minutes to speak to you on the subject of looking to the promise. Looking to the promise. Before you see it, look at your neighbor and tell them there is a promise for you. And you can go ahead and have your seat this morning. I want to welcome those of you that are also viewing us online. I want to talk to you about looking to the promise. Hasn't it been a, a, a great month? You know, over this last number of weeks, it's really been a time where we've been talking about, you know, the, the history of the church and all the great things that God has done here in San Diego, all of the promises fulfilled and how many know God will fulfill his promises in our life. And then uh, was it last week, I think, that they were talking about my, my story and, and, and the miracle that God did for me and how God brought me along the way. And now God has raised Regina and I up and he's raised up our church. And how many know God is faithful? Yes. And I, I want to tell you that, you know, I've really been reflecting on these stories. Um, I want to share one more story with you about uh, I can still remember very vividly the night before uh, I moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, we were living in the discipleship home in LA and we were ready to go out there to the East Coast to start the UTC and really essentially to kind of start our ministry. Now we know every, everything has a humble beginning. And I remember that night we had a U-Haul in the uh, driveway and was full of all kinds of stuff. I can't even remember what was in that U-Haul. I know it was just a bunch of stuff that we put in that U-Haul. I remember Georgina was pregnant at the time, uh, just a few months pregnant, maybe just a couple months pregnant with Avery. And, uh, or actually, no, I'm sorry, she had had the baby. <laughs> See, my memory jogs me. <laughs> but Avery was just a few months old. And what, what I always marveled about Georgina is that before we went to the East Coast, she hadn't even seen Bridgeport yet. She had never been there. She went in blind faith. And so we had this U-Haul in the driveway full of stuff, ready to leave the next morning. And I got this crazy idea. There was a preacher in town, a famous preacher. You might know his name if I mentioned it. And I thought to myself, man, you know, I'm a little bit nervous about this move. I'm a little bit nervous about going to the East Coast. I, I don't know what is going to be on the other side. Have you ever been there? Uh -huh. And I called a friend of mine who she was Pastor Sonny's secretary, a good friend I grew up with. And she's Pastor Sonny's secretary. And I said, hey, Felicia, I go, can you do me a favor? She goes, what do you need? And at that point, anybody would have done anything for me. And they, I was leaving. And they, were, they loved me. <laughs> and I says, can you get me some seats to this conference where this preacher's preaching tonight? She said, tonight? I said, tonight. I go, girl, drop names up in this place. <laughs> Call the conference and tell them it's for past the seats are for Pastor Sonny Sr. Oh and I and knowing her, she bites her fingernails when she's nervous. She's like, e I don't know, you know. I'm like, come on, Felicia, do you love me? She goes, you know I love you. I said, feed my sheep. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she says, you know I love you. I go, come on, just do it, man. We used to do a lot of crazy things in the world. Come on, just do it. And she goes, I'm going to do it, but if I get in trouble. Uh -oh. So anyway, she did it. She ended up getting a number of seats. And me and her and uh, my brother-in-law, Tim, and a few of us, we went over there to this conference to hear this preacher. You know, I was leaving the next morning. I, I just felt like I needed one more word from God. Have you ever been there? And I remember when we walked into the arena. I mean, there's 13,000 people there. I think it was in Anaheim, somewhere in Anaheim. And we walk into the place, and they take us right to the front row. 
So they're expecting Pastor Sonny Sr. to be there. But it's me, Tim, Felicia, Roseanne, a few other people. We walk in like a little late, like we are. Come on, somebody. And we sit in the front, and it was a great night. But I remember when the preacher got up there to speak, man. He spoke right out of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Right out of the scripture I read to you this morning. And he began to talk about the calling of God. And he began to speak about how many of you who are in this place, God has called you, God has chosen you, and God is taking you out of your hometown, and he's going to take you to a foreign territory. And if there was a word that I needed to hear, it was that word. Even in the middle of his sermon, he started to say, and some of you in this room right now, you even have a U-Haul in your driveway. And it's already full, and you're ready to leave. And the minute he said that, everybody looked at me and said, he's talking about you. He's talking about us. They were high-fiving me. And how many know when you need a word from the Lord, God is always faithful. God will always speak to you in the right season. Can I hear an amen? It was a powerful confirmation that God did call me. It was a powerful confirmation that God was with me. But I think it was also a confirmation. I kind of felt like it was God taking his holy foot. Come on, somebody. And kind of kicking me out the door. Can I hear an amen? And how many know sometimes you need that? When we look at Abraham, we see the quintessential man of faith. And, and we see that his life teaches us that to walk by faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Now, this year, I'm going to be teaching a lot about faith. I'm going to be teaching a lot about faith. This is the word that God has placed in my heart for this church, that this is a year where God wants to take our faith to another level. We talk about vision. We talk about increase. We talk about raising up leaders. But how many of none of it is possible unless God begins to grow our faith? Someone say faith. And when we look at Abraham's life, his his life teaches us three things about faith, that faith requires a leaving, a living, and a looking. I shared this with you before. I think it's worth reviewing one more time, that if you're going to walk by faith, you must be involved in leaving, you must be involved in living, and you must be involved in looking. The first thing we learn from Abraham is that Abraham left the place of his past. Abraham left the place of his past. You know here in this scripture that the Lord called him to leave his hometown. The Bible says in the scripture, he tells him, get out of your country and away from your family. What God was telling Abraham here is get away from everything that's familiar within your life. Come on, say amen. amen. He left his place of his past. He left his hometown. And he was willing to go on a journey for the Lord. So here's the lesson that we can learn this morning is that when God asks us to leave something, it's always so that he invites us to be able to live with him. God never calls you to leave something so that you will have to walk alone. Tell your neighbor you're not alone. God will never call you to be alone. When God calls you to leave something, God invites you to walk very closely with him. How many love that? He says, you can walk with me. See, what made Abraham want to leave? Here's what made Abraham want to leave right here. Write this down. God told him, you can leave because I have an inheritance for you. God says, it's okay to leave that thing because you're going to walk with me. And not only are you going to walk with me, but you need to understand that I have an inheritance for your life. I, that makes me excited. That God has not only an inheritance for my life, but that God also has a plan for my life. And that God not only has a plan for my life, but how many know that God also has a purpose for my life? And not only does God have a purpose for my life, but God has a destiny for my life that to walk with God is to walk with purpose. To walk with God is to walk in a plan. To walk with God is to walk with a powerful destiny. I'm going to let you go ahead and praise him for that. 
because we knew what it was to not have a purpose we knew what it was not to have a plan we knew what it was to walk in confusion we knew what it was to walk in fear but we came out of fear and we stepped into faith and we walked with God and God says I got a plan for you tell your neighbor it's a good plan see God is saying I have a will for your life and you'll never fulfill my plan dwelling in old territory. I think that's why speaking about faith is so important. Because we can never be what God has called us to be as long as we're hanging out in old territory. He's calling us out. Someone once asked me, Pastor Al, how is it that God has done such a great work in your life? How is it that God has raised you up? How is it that God has blessed you? How is it that God has increased you from year after year after year? And I'll tell you why. I've learned this. I've learned to hear God when he says, walk away from something. I have. I've learned how to hear the voice of God when God says, walk away from that relationship. Walk away from that partnership. Walk away from those people. Walk away from that city. Walk away from that job. You ain't saying nothing to me. Amen. See, this is why we got to speak about faith. Because if you're going to get to the place that God has called you to be, you've got to learn how to say goodbye to your past and hello to your future. Yeah. Woo, come on and give him a good shout of praise in this place. You've got to walk away. Remember the rich young ruler, he says, I have it all. He says, I want to be your follower, Lord. And the Lord says, you're missing one thing. Take all you have and sell it. And we find that this rich young ruler was unable to do that. Maybe you know someone like that. They're unable to get rid of that thing that is keeping them out of God's perfect will. And the Bible says that because the rich young ruler was unable to walk away. Someone say, walk away. The Bible says that he went away very sad. And it's sad when you're not doing God's will. It's sad when you don't know what God has called you to. It's sad when your marriage has no purpose. It's sad you ain't saying nothing to me. But when you know that you are in the place God has called you to be, come on somebody, one great indication is that there's joy in your life. There's victory in your life. There's purpose in your life. So Abraham left the place of his past. The second thing we see is that he also left his past, but he also lived for God. So he left his past. But secondly, to walk in faith is to live for the Lord. How many of you are living for the Lord? How many of you are living for the Lord? You, you say, man, I'm not just coming to church, man. I'm living for the Lord. You say, I'm living for the Lord, man. God has opened every door in my life. God has made a way where there seemed to be nowhere. I am living for the Lord. Well, Abraham lived for the Lord. We find, though, that even though God gave him a promise, there was still a challenge. That even though God said, I have an inheritance for you and I have a purpose for you. How many of you know that Abraham, he, he wasn't ready? He wasn't fully ready for the full inheritance and the full blessing that God had for his life. I think about David. David was anointed to be king at 16 years old, but he didn't become king until he was in his 30s. In fact, there was a little season in there where David had to actually live in a cave. You ain't saying nothing to me right now. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, where are you living? <laughs> Abraham wasn't ready. Abraham still had some stuff going on in his life. Is this a good word? He still had some hang-ups. He still had some, some, some complexes. Woo, he, he still had some issues. The tissue box was empty because he still had some tears. Come on, he still had some debt. He still had some fears. He still had some problems. The, the Bible tells us that Abraham was still a liar. He, was still, he still had a lying problem. He was a liar. Can I hear an amen? He, 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 he was still lying. He even laughed at God when God said, I'm going to give you a son. He laughed. He mocked God. He didn't have reverence for God's promises. 
He even slept with his maidservant, Hagar. He tried to rush the process. He got ahead of God. Abraham made many, many mistakes. Is there anyone here that's ever made any mistakes in your life? You've ever blown it. Can I hear an amen? You've ever, come on now, help me. You've ever blown it. You've ever blew it. You ever, you know, missed it. Come on, somebody. You, you ever didn't do what you were supposed to do. But here's the word for you, that even though he wasn't perfect, and even though Abraham didn't have it all together, God never moved the inheritance. God never removed the promise. God never removed the word that he spoke over Abraham's life. And that should give you hope this morning, is that there's still a word. There's still a promise. There's still a destiny there's still an inheritance you might have messed up last night but god says i haven't moved the word i'm going to wait on you to grow i'm going to wait on you to develop i'm going to wait on you to be obedient i'm going to wait on you because i'm a patient god i'm a patient father i'm a father that's looking over my word to perform it in your life i just need somebody to understand that if you are in the process this morning don't give up on the process don't get off the potter's wheel don't jump out of the fiery furnace don't come out of the cave until you're ready he's just preparing you he's preparing you for the promise and I want you to know that the promise is not little well God gave me a car that's not the promise well, God gave me a job. That's not the promise. What's the matter with God gave me a rib? That's not the promise. God gave you the rib to help you fulfill the promise. The promise is not little. The promise is ginormous. It's a generational promise. It's a promise that's going to outlive you. It's a promise that's going to outlive you when they put you in the ground and your spirit and soul are with the Lord. The promise is going to live on in your children. And then when they're gone, it's going to live on in their children. It's going to go from generation to generation to generation. There's going to be a generation in your family that's never going to know you were a drug addict. There's going to be a generation in your family that's going to never know you were a gang member. They're not going to believe that at one time you were lost. All they're going to know is that the word of God reigns victory over their family. And God has been king from generation to generation. It's a big promise. And maybe you're here right now and you find yourself on that part as well. Listen, just stay on there. <laughs> you know, I don't like it. Stay on the wheel. You find yourself in the fiery furnace. Stay in the furnace. You find yourself in the cave. Don't come out the cave until you learn how to do spiritual battle. See, he's preparing the promise for us. And he's preparing us for the promise. And the promise is not small. Galatians 6 9 says, And let us not grow weary in well doing. For in due season, someone say, Due season, we will reap the harvest if. Come on. If. See, quitters don't get it. But it says, If we don't what? We don't give up or lose heart. Praise the Lord. So the final thing here is that Abraham looked to the promises of God. He he, he left his past. He lived with God. He lived for God. But then thirdly, he looked to the promises of God. Now, now notice here in, in the statement is that Abraham didn't look at the promise. But he looked at the God of the promise. And I think this is so important. He looked at the God of the promise. He didn't look just for the blessing. Now, how many know God will bless you? But he looked at the blessor. He learned how to keep his heart stayed on the blessor. Amen. That even when he wasn't being blessed, he never took his eye off the blessor. Amen. That even when he was in a season where things were not happening in his life, he kept his heart and his eyes and his faith in the one that gave him the word from the beginning. And in this season, Abraham learned to walk closely to God during times of preparation and also times of testing. And I think there's many of us here this morning that you are in a season of preparation. 
You're in a season of testing. You're in a season of discomfort in your life. But it's in that season where we have to learn to walk by faith and not by feeling. We have to learn to trust God in the process of what God is doing. One thing I think Abraham learned, and I know something that I've learned, I know some of you have learned this as well, is that success is not a straight line. Isn't it true? Sometimes you just think, like, man, if I just do everything right, I'm going to be successful. Man, what I've learned is that even when you do everything right, the, the road is still crooked. You know, that's disheartening. So, man, I've done everything right. I've, I've, you know, I've killed devils. Can I hear an amen? Just to stay right with God. And the road's still crooked. And I don't know why it's that way. All I know is that the road to success is not a straight line. It's a winding road. But what we have to learn is that no matter the circumstances and no matter the challenges that we face and no matter the twists and turns on the road to destiny, Abraham held on to his faith. He held on to his word. And he's a great example to us that we are on a journey of faith. Now, it's documented in the scripture that Abraham built four different altars on this journey. And I want to kind of delve into that very quickly. You get some so far? Amen. Because we are on a journey. The journey continues. We've accomplished many things up to this point. But the journey continues. And we're on a journey of faith. It's documented that he built four altars on this journey. These altars represent milestones. We know that in the journey of faith, there's going to be peaks and there's going to be valleys. We know that there's going to be twists and there's turns. But when we look at the altars that Abraham built on the journey, we can look at those as peaks, as monuments, as moments, key moments that we as journeyers of faith, key moments that we as people who are on this spiritual journey can point to in times of discouragement, can point to in times where we feel like getting off the journey of faith. So I want to talk very quickly about these four altars that Abraham built. I believe it will build you in your faith. Number one, write this down, is that Abraham built an altar of promise or an altar of praise. An altar of promise. Everybody say promise. promise. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. It says, And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother-in-law, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, and Abraham passed through the land of the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. Look at this. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Say, the Canaanites Amen. were in the land. Understand that the Canaanites were the descendants of Cain, the one who killed Abel. So they were the enemies of God. But in verse 7, look what the Lord said to Abram. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. To your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So the first thing we find here is that Abraham built an altar of promise. Say, there is a promise. And in Genesis 12, 5, verse 7, this is the first place where Abraham came face to face with the territory God wanted to give him. It was the first time he'd come face to face with the territory God wanted to give him. But what you find is that even when God spoke about giving him that territory, the territory was already occupied with the enemies of God. The territory was already occupied with the enemies of God. So here is what made the promise powerful. What made the promise powerful is that even though the enemy was in the land, even though the enemies of God were in the end, in the land, even though there was opposition in the land, God did not relent to let his servant know that I'm still going to give you this territory, even if I have to run these devils out of town. Come on and give him praise right now. 
I'm going to give you this land even though your enemy dwells there. I'm going to give you this land even though addiction dwells there. I'm going to give you this land even though it doesn't look like it's going your way right now. But you hold on and you wait because I'm going to give you this territory. This territory doesn't belong to the world. This territory doesn't belong to your past. This territory doesn't belong to the devil. I came to tell you, Abraham, this territory belongs to you. Put your hand in your heart and say, God's given me a territory. He's given you a promise, even though it's not working in your favor right now. So here's what I want to say to you, and I want to ask you a question, church. Is God faithful? Let me hear the people of faith. Is God faithful? Can he do it? Can he heal you? Can he restore? Yes. Can he save? Yes. Then you want to start praising him now? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead and praise him all of 2018. Yeah. Praise him in February for what he's going to do in June. Yeah. Praise him in June for what he's going to do in December. Because if God said he's going to do it, then it surely shall come to pass, even though your enemy is still in the territory. So he built an altar. And I was visualizing too like these altars that he built. I wonder what the enemy thought. You know, they, the Bible doesn't tell us they tore him down. They probably walked by him and like, what's this? And Abraham, Abraham must have been like, well, you wait and see. Tell your neighbor, wait and see that the Lord is good. The second altar is that Abraham built an altar of prayer. Okay. We're journeyers. We're on a journey. We need an altar to know that there's a promise. Say, there's a promise. But then he built an altar of prayer. In Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 8, it says, And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Look at this. And there he built an altar. Someone say, another altar. He built an altar to the Lord. Look at this. And he called on the name of the Lord. He built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. I think there are some people who've been walking by faith for a long time here. And you know, man, you can't make it unless you learn to call on the name of the Lord. How many of you, come on, just wave at me if you know, Pastor, say it again and again and again. Right? Say, Pastor, just keep on saying it because you, you can't make it unless you call on the name of the Lord. And Abraham, he, he, he recognized that not only was there a promise, but as a, as a journeyer of faith, as a man of faith, he had to learn how to call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says he inquired of the Lord. In other words, in other words to, to inquire of something is to ask a question. Can I hear an amen? And I think that's the type of prayer people of faith have. They, they have questions for God. They say, God, what are you doing in my life? God, where am I going? What's the next step? Who should I marry? Come on, somebody. Who should I date? Can I hear an amen? Should I take this job? Should I not take this job? Come on, somebody. And he learned to inquire of the Lord. Or, or, or Abraham prayed. Or Abraham sought the Lord. But the bottom line is this. And this needs to be the bottom line for us. Is that every great journey or every great leader in scripture had a prayer life. Every great leader in scripture had a prayer life. Every great leader in scripture, every leader who saw the promise come to pass had a prayer life. They knew how to get into the presence of God. They knew how to trust in the Lord. They, 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 they live by Proverbs, right? In, in 3, 5, it says, lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all. See, I, we've got some people here. You're not getting there because you're a leaner. You're a leaner. You can't get to your, your future because you're a leaner. You lean on your own understanding. You're always leaning. You should change your name to Eileen. Can I hear an amen? But this is a year where you stop leaning on you and you start leaning on God. You start leaning on that prayer altar. Come on, somebody. You, you need to build an altar and, and you need to go home and, and you need to stop leaning on your Xbox and leaning on your television and you need to get that altar. You need to just lean on the altar and say, God, I'm not going to leave here until you speak to me. I'm not going to get away from your presence until you... Is there anybody that wants to lean on the Lord this year and just lean on his wisdom? 
need to find a spiritual leader in your life and you got to lean on them. Say, man, I just need to lean on you. I just need to get God's word and direction in my life. So he built an altar of prayer. Someone say prayer. The third thing is that Abraham built an altar of peace. Look at Genesis 13. This is going to be pretty heavy right here. He inherited Canaan. That was the promise. And he inquired of the Lord in tough times. But he built an altar of peace because how many know that when God gives you a promise, doubt always tries to creep in? Genesis 13, verse 3 says, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Notice that. Where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there. That was the altar prayer. Someone say prayer. And there, look what he did. He called on the name of the Lord again. And then Lot also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was unable to support them. And they, that they might dwell together for the possession is so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife. There was division between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then also still dwelt in the land. Now, in, in verse 4, it says that Abraham had to come to a place where he revisited the altar of prayer. And I want to tell you that there's going to be times in this journey where the devil tries to get you to question the promise. What was causing Abraham to question the promise was this. Is God told Abraham, I'm going to give you the territory. And Abraham was being faithful, but what God was doing was God was blessing everybody else and not running them out. He was blessing the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and then his nephew Lot came up. And Abraham saying, wait a minute. I thought that was my word. Oh, you ain't saying nothing to me. I thought I was the one that was supposed to get blessed. I thought I was the one that was supposed. Why is it that Lot, this crazy nephew of mine, who I didn't even invite, he jumped in the U-Haul. He finagled his way into the scene can i hear an amen he wasn't even invited this crazy in-law outlaw whatever he is and he's the one getting blessed and not only is he getting blessed but my enemies are getting blessed god what about me you spoke to me you said you're going to give me this land and all these fools and all these jacks are still here but notice this is it abraham didn't leave the land Abraham didn't leave the church. Abraham didn't leave the ministry. Abraham went back to the altar of prayer. Come on, if you caught it, come on. He went back to the altar of prayer. And watch what the Lord does in verse 17. Are you with me? In chapter 13, verse 17. He reminds Abraham of the promise. And then in verse 17, look what he tells Abraham. He says, arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I have given it to you. This is so good. Because sometimes when you're doubting the promise, God says, get out of your pity party. Get out of your complaining. Get out of your sniveling. Come on, help your preacher. Get out of that funky attitude. And get up off your blessed assurance. And you begin to walk the length. And you begin to walk the width of the land that I promised you many years ago. And you begin to remind yourself that I'm the God who is faithful. 
And every step you take, you begin to remember that everywhere you put your foot, I've given you that territory. You may not see it now, but I've got you in a process. You may not see it now, but I'm working on your character. You may not see it now, but I'm pulling some negative things out of your life. But you just go ahead and keep on walking the breath and keep on walking the width of it. Because in due season, if you don't lose heart, I'm going to give you that land. I'm going to give you that. I think you ought to take a praise break right now and recognize that if you have been discouraged, God is not done with the promise. If you have been feeling like giving up, God says, walk the territory, walk the land, claim the promises once again. Touch someone and tell them there is a promise. I'm going to tell those 1030 people, I don't know if I can do this in the next service. So y'all missed out. Tell your neighbor, there's a promise. Walk the land. That kid ain't home right now. They ran away from home. You go in their room. And walk the land and say, this kid belongs to God. This child belongs to this family. This ha- God has a plan over this child. Come on, walk the, walk the land. Walk the territory. Revisit the promise. And what's the fourth? So Abraham there, look at, he built a new altar. In verse 17, says, God gave him the land. And says, and Abram moved his tent, and he went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamer, which is the Hebron, look at this, and he built another altar there. It was the altar of reminder. Can I hear an amen? And how many know peace always comes with the reminder? So he told him to walk the territory, review the promise. He says, God, I've never failed. God's never failed this yet. And you got to tell the devil, you can't have it. Claim it. This is your word. Claim the promise, but then also reclaim the promise. And then claim it again. And then reclaim it again and just claim it all this year. Can I hear an amen? Give God a good, good praise. I'm done. I'm down to my last point. Come on up, Matthew or Mike or Matthew, which, whichever. The last thing is that Abraham built a final altar. And that altar is found in Genesis chapter 22. It's the altar of. It was an altar. It really was an altar of sacrifice. But God changed it to an altar of provision. Because in Genesis 22, you know the story very well. We see a critical test for Abraham is that God certainly did bring, look at this, part of the promise to pass. Because he told Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you a son. Didn't he tell him that? And in Abraham's mind, he might have thought that that was the whole blessing. But in God's mind, God says, no, 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 that's just part of the blessing. I think some of us need to look at this year with this mindset. I don't have it all yet. But God has given me part of it. Come on, how many can say amen? amen? He's given you part of it. Isaac was just part of the blessing. And then Abraham tells him to take the son and go to the mountaintop. And you know the story, to sacrifice him to the Lord. See, God didn't want an ordinary sacrifice. God wanted Abraham's very best. He wanted him to give him his son. And here's what I want to tell you as I close this message is that whenever God gets ready to fulfill his promise in our lives, he wants to make sure that our priorities are in order. He wants to make sure that our priorities are in order. By asking Abraham to make this offering, he was asking him two important things. The first thing he was asking was this, am I still number one in your life? Now that I've blessed you, now that I've increased you, now that I've opened up doors, now, and I, and I see it all the time. Listen, 
it, it's sad to see how many people they come to church broken with nothing God heals them God restores them God builds them up God blesses them and then they take off with just part of the promise and then ultimately down the road they end up losing the promise because they don't have the character to keep the promise they jump off the wheel too early tell your neighbor stay on the wheel God tells them am I still number one are you serving the promise or are you serving the promise maker the promise giver so whenever God gets ready to give you fulfill your, his promise he always wants to see if he's still number one in your life but here's the second thing God is also asking him another question are you still willing to sacrifice are you still willing to sacrifice and I think that that's a word for many of us here this morning. God has been good. Hasn't he been good? Has God been faithful in our lives? Has he kept us? Has he blessed us? God's saying, I've been good to you, but are you still willing to sacrifice to me? Or are you going to stop sacrificing to me? Are you going to be one of those Christians that get blessed and stops praying? Are you going to be one of those Christians that gets blessed and stops doing ministry? Are you going to be one of those Christians that gets blessed and stops taking care of people, stops loving people, stops loving the unlovable, stops reaching the unreachable, stops teaching the unteachable? What kind of Christian are you going to be? This is good stuff. Are you going to be one of those Christians that gets blessed, but then you stop tithing? Are you going to be one of those Christians that gets blessed, but you stop making pledges and you stop seeing the vision that God has given your church? Are you going, are you going to back down? Are you going to start holding back now that I've blessed you? Are you going to start holding black back now that I've blessed you? You know what happens? It, it, it's even happening right now. I was, I was kind of a little bit sad, you know, and I've been blessed. You guys have been so good, good to me as a pastor. And I was so kind of, you know, a little bit sad to see that ever since we paid off our building, our ties have gone down. Our ties have gone down. And I said, oh, is that what it is now? Everybody's going to camp out and die. That's why I told you in the beginning, we made history. But here's what I want to tell you. If we don't keep sacrificing, we will be history. We'll be history. God will say, okay, I'm going to move my blessing somewhere else. I even, you guys even blessed me as a pastor. I was so blessed. You gave me a watch. This is a beautiful watch. You see this watch here? That's a nice watch. That's a world-class watch you gave me. And everybody pitched in from our church to buy me this watch. I was crying, broken. And I was so grateful for this watch. Every time I look at it, I'm going to remind, be reminded of your love. But then I don't want to be hurt because you blessed me that you stopped sacrificing to the Lord. I wouldn't want this watch if, it, if you took it out of your tithe. Because basically, you're putting a curse on me. You're taking what belongs to God and you're giving it to me and you're cursing me. You're cursing your preacher. That's strong, huh? But that's what it is. And I would much rather give this watch up so that the tithe can stay holy to the Lord. The tithe belongs to the Lord. I'm trying to raise you guys right. Can I hear an amen? The building. Thank God for the building. But the tithe belongs to the Lord. And it doesn't matter if we have this building or we get a new building. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I would never want you to take what belongs to the Lord. Because when you lose that spirit of sacrifice, we don't do much. Like, we're not laying our life down every week here, you know. We're not, you know, you know, it's not blood being shed or weaker. You know, we're not, you know, you know, doing that kind of thing. What we're doing is we're worshiping the Lord in a beautiful place. But the only moment of sacrifice that we have here that goes to the Lord is, not, is twofold. Number one, it's our worship, what we sing to the Lord. And if you don't sing to the Lord, then you're not a sacrificer. If you just sit down during the worship, you're not a sacrificer, you're a taker. 
How many know the Lord rejoices in our worship and in our singing to the Lord? So that's a moment of sacrifice. Some of you come late. You don't even come to the worship. Then second is the time of giving. We're sacrificing to the Lord. Yes, we're paying our tithes, giving what belongs to him. But we're making an earthly sacrifice to the Lord. How many can say amen? And I want to tell you this. God's got a promise. There is a promise. But he's looking for a people. He's looking for a people that will put him first. That will keep him first. Because what I've learned is this, is that when we don't keep God first, we don't have the character to sustain the promise. Giving and sacrificing keeps God involved in your journey. Because the Bible teaches us that God is attracted to the sacrifice. Amen. Some of you are saying, Pastor, you are so good. You preach that powerful message, and at the end, you came with a giving right at the end. That's right. I know what I'm doing here. Come on, somebody. Because I know what's going to keep you blessed on this journey. It's not going to be you dancing at the altar. Some of the, some of the most broke people always dance at the altar. Some of the tightest people. Are, Sit down, Jack. You're not even going to be here next month. It's the people that have learned to give. It's the people that keep God first in their finances. It's the people that have learned to sacrifice to the Lord. Can I hear an amen? And I, I want to raise up a people in this church that are not going to just be on this journey for one month and be on this journey for three months. I want to raise up a people that are going to see this blessing go from generation to generation to generation to generation. There is a promise. There is a promise. And that's why what I want to do right now is I want to take another tithe and another offering. I'm going to ask the ushers to.